My name is Sarah Holliday, and it's a privilege to be with you once again. Um, Reliance Women's Ministry. Woo! As Gloria said earlier, this is our last, our last chapter of Hebrews. I know, kind of sad. It's been amazing, right? Am I right or am I right? It's been amazing. Yeah, I'll be honest with you, though. The first, time, the first few times I read chapter 13 of Hebrews, it seemed kind of random. Um, it talks about, you know, like secret undercover angels. It talks about adultery. And then closes with Timothy being in jail. Like, what? <laughs> when, did, when, when did he go to jail? I don't know. <clears throat> it kind of feels as if the writer almost threw together all of their final thoughts and then just blessed the, blessed the church, blessed the Hebrews and closed. But as we study today, hopefully we can see the connections of practical wisdom and the spiritual wisdom. So let's turn to Hebrews chapter 13. And just a recap, in the first 10 chapters of Hebrews, we've seen how Jesus is greater than, right? We've seen that he's superior to and that he's better than the angels. He's better than Moses or any other prophet. How he's the most high priest. The, he's the ultimate sacrifice. And how his blood speaks a better word, right? His blood is, is the better covenant full of hope. And we have that promise in him. But after studying through all of these rich theological truths about who Christ is, I find myself asking the question, as I'm pretty sure the Hebrews probably did, um, what now? What now? Yes, Jesus is superior than all of those things, but what does that mean for me? What does that mean for the believer today? What did that mean for the Hebrews? Remember, the Hebrews were Christians who were struggling with their faith, um, like the Israelites in the desert some of them longed to go back to Egypt, right, to their old ways of life because it was easier, because it was comfortable, because of the several pressures from the surrounding environments, right? They were being oppressed from practicing, those practicing Judaism, but they were also being oppressed by the Roman government. And so the writer of Hebrews, he breaks down in the first 10 chapters why Jesus is king, why he's greater. But after receiving all of those deep truths, all of this doctrine, what do we do with it? That's the question, right? See, in order, to, in order for all of this doctrine that we've learned to mean anything, in order for all of this knowledge that we've stored up about who Jesus is to affect our lives, it must reach our hearts and it must translate into our everyday living. As we come to know Christ, we grow. As we grow, we model his example. As we model his example and imitate who he is, we produce the fruits of the Holy Spirit. So what do we do with this doctrine that we've learned? Do we store it up and get fat with self-righteousness? Do we use it as a weapon to beat down sinners or heap guilt and legalism onto people? Yeah, Jesus is greater, but what do I do now? Yeah, Christianity Christianity is the only way, so what? What does that mean for me? What does that mean for the believer? Well, our response in chapter 11, as we read a few weeks ago, is to have a little faith, to believe that God is who he says he is. That many saints have gone before us and will come after us means that we're never alone in this journey of life. Our response in chapter 12, what we saw last week with faith, is to endure the sanctification process. It's a process to keep going, to keep running, to lay aside every weight and sin that easily ensnares us, the behaviors that, that slow us down to endure. And now we come to this final chapter, Hebrews 13, the last words, the epilogue or the final plea, the final appeal to stay the course. What should our response be to the fact that Jesus is greater, that he's more superior, that he's better? Well, let's jump in, right? Chapter 13 is broken down into a few sections. There's practical reminders, there's spiritual reminders, and then there's a final farewell benediction blessing of the writer. And FYI, today, I can't cover the whole thing. There's too much, but I will be spending most, most of the time focusing on the practical reminders, the, the practical application. Um, so let's read verse 1 through 4. Chapter 13, verses 1 through 4, it says, Let love of the brothers and sisters continue. Do not neglect hospitality to strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. 
Remember the prisoners as though in prison with them and those who are badly treated since you yourselves also are in the body. Marriage is to be held in honor among all and the marriage bed is to be undefiled for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterers. Right off the bat, what is our response to all of Hebrews chapter 1 through 10? Love. Love is the motive for all of these verses. How can we live in obedience to Christ? In verse 1, our love for Christ should produce a love for his church, a love for the brethren. See, community within the body of believers is vital to our spiritual growth and maturity. We come together to encourage, to exhort, to rebuke, mm, mm mm-mm, to rebuke, to confess our struggles and our sin to one another, right? We heard a little bit about this type of fellowship on Saturday with the quick clicks. Robin taught, right? How many of you were there? Yeah, it was really fun. It was really cool. I'm not just saying that because I went to Jamie's group, Janie's group, but um, I went to the coffee and games. I lost every game, but the coffee was good. I'm glad I went. But fellowship with believers is necessary because some of us, for some of us, Believers are the only real family we'll have on this earth. See, for some context, the Hebrews most likely left the comfort and the familiarity of their old faith to join in with Christians. They're probably dealing with rejection from their families, being ostracized by their friends they've known their whole lives, but they found an even deeper relationship, a spiritual relationship with the believers around them. That's how it should be for us. To some right here, this might be the only family we experience. John chapter 15, verses 12 and 13 says, This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. Jesus ultimately, yes, he ultimately displayed his love on the cross for us, right? But the company that he kept while he was here on earth was a brotherhood of love, of correction, of teaching, and of discipline, of discipleship. He spent quality time with the people around them, fishing, eating, serving, preaching, loving even the one who wandered away and sold them for 30 pieces of silver. Brotherly love is not always easy. Right? I think of how Jesus could love Judas. Even though he perfectly knew everything that he was going to do. But he chose to love him and die for him on the cross and die for people like him on the cross. As Christians, honestly, we can be so cruel to other Christians. I don't know. I, I just looked on Facebook for like two seconds the other day and it's wild out there. We can be so cruel. Sometimes we get caught up in how we think the church should look, how the, how the church is supposed to look, and we forget that we're all just people broken and messy and in need of a savior. There was a, a study done by the Barna Research Group called A New Generation Expresses Its Skepticism and Frustration with Christianity. So in this study, they found that almost 90% of respondents think that Christians are judgmental and uninviting. No love. One in four of the respondents said that the modern day, that modern day Christianity is no longer like Jesus. Yikes. As Pastor Ted says, we need to put faith, we need to put feet to our faith and love. John chapter 13, Jesus says in verse 35, by this you will all, they will all know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another, a love that's patient and kind, that keeps no record of wrongs a compassion for those who have lost their way. And that love should stir us into action. As Christ followers, we have a duty to hospitality. So in verse two, we see our love for the church should produce a hospitable and generous heart within us. At the time this book was written, it was actually dangerous and expensive to travel. It was dangerous to stay at an inn. They They were even likened to brothels at the time. 
ministers and teachers who were traveling to speak, less fortunate Christians who couldn't afford staying at an inn, desperately needed the hospitality of believers. It was written that inns were a place of prostitution and abuse, that many, many people would be robbed and beaten if they were at the wrong place at the wrong time. The ends were unfit and unsafe for the believers. So the writer of Hebrews is encouraging those who are able, if you are able, pursue hospitality. Pursue generosity. When we acknowledge Christ, all that he's done for us, how he's been generous and kind and tenderhearted to us, we can't help but be giving and generous to other people. And here... Um, I'm not going to skip this because I thought it was kind of interesting, but the subject of entertaining angels unawares comes up. Um, yeah, that's interesting, right? It's, it'd be easier just to skip that. But there are actually quite a few inst instances in the Old Testament where people were in the presence of an angel without even knowing it. Angel in the Greek is angelos, angelos. It means to bring tidings, a messenger, one who is sent by God. And when we think of the word angel, many of us think of a supernatural being with wings and a halo because that's how it, they've been portrayed in art or in media. Personally, I like to think of the classic um, Touched by an Angel. <laughs> I like to think of, you know, I, I used to love that show with my mom. I'll walk with you. <laughs> but in reality... The subject of angels is not something we talk about often or correctly. And frankly, I think it's because the church, we don't know enough about them to determine whether or not guardian angels are real, if they're a thing. We don't know en enough about the spiritual realm to, to actually be able to, to put into words what it looks like. You know, the, the popular worship song from a few years ago, the God of angel armies is all, always on my side. What is an angel army? What is a host of heavenly beings? And why does God choose to use them to fight for us? See, all of these questions come into my mind when I read about angels being undercover. Why would he use angels when he could easily just snap his fingers and do it himself? Well, why does he use us? Why does he use you or me? We don't even really acknowledge that there are different types of angels in the Bible, and I won't get into it too much, um, but some have six wings, like in Isaiah, you know, they're called the seraphim. Did you know that the, the definition for seraphim is serpent, fiery serpent? That's not exactly the picture of the cute newborn baby with rosy cheeks and wings that I have, you know? That's, it's a fiery serpent. Angels probably look terrifying, but then there's also the example of angels that we see who are walking around just like people, like in Genesis and in the book of Judges. See, the main point here in this verse isn't about the fantastical study of angels. Like, that's really cool, but that's not the main point, as fascinating as it can be. It's about being kind and hospitable because of the love of Christ that is inside of us. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus says that when he's in heaven, when he's seated on the throne of his glory, he will remember those who took care of the sick, who took care of the hungry and the thirsty, those who needed a friend. He will remember them just as if they helped Christ himself. 25 verse 40 says, And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. You never know what God can do with your kindness and your obedience, with your hospitality, with, with what little you have, your hospitality. Our love for the church should produce a hospitable and kind heart. And loving others also means having compassion for those that are in trouble. Right? Verse 3, our love for the church should produce compassion for those in trouble. Remember the prisoners as though in prison with them and those who are badly treated since you yourselves are also in the body. See, like Christ and like Paul and like Timothy, apparently, Christians at this time were no stranger to being imprisoned for their faith. The Hebrews were encouraged to remember those who were in trouble just as if they were in trouble themselves. And I love that we had a moment of time to worship while Faith was singing, to worship and to remember the saints that were in Ukraine, the brethren all over the world who were being persecuted, and magnify the Lord for them on their behalf and rejoice. That's what we're supposed to do. That's how it should be. 
you know, the takeaway from this, this verse in, in modern days that we're all part of the body of Christ. We are all part of the body. And where one is suffering and lacking, we're all lacking. Persecution and, and imprisonment. Um, it, it, for our religious beliefs, it may not something that we worry about today in America. I should say yet, right? We, we don't worry about it yet. God forbid it happens. But it's literally a reality for Christian and brethren around the world. And it's our duty to pray, to take a minute just to stop and think about them and pray for them and to give as we are able. And we see in verse four, our love for Christ should produce sexual purity. We don't really talk about sex a lot in, in church. We don't really talk about it in, even in the covenant of marriage. We, it's, it's something that we stay away from because it's a little bit uncomfortable but our love for Christ should produce sexual purity, and it should produce a heart that loves one person, one man, our husbands, our spouses. It says marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterers. See, we touched a little bit about this in Hebrews chapter 12, when it talks about Esau being driven by his sexual appetite and his lack of self-control. God was not pleased with his, with his sacrifice. And as followers of, followers of Christ, we're to be committed and dedicated to one partner and one person, our husbands if we're married and Christ if we're not married. Marriage is a union between two people before God and it should be held in high regard and respect. However, however, we're to be set apart from the world by our purity of heart as well, not just Purity of body. Purity of heart and mind and soul, something that only a radical relationship with Christ can give us. We can't have purity of heart and mind and soul by just putting locks on our phones so that we don't look at things we don't, we're not supposed to look at. It comes from a radical relationship with Jesus. Lord, take me all of my uncleanness and make me clean. Because I want to look at things I'm not supposed to look. I want to watch stuff that I shouldn't watch. I want to behave and lust after things that I should not lust after. Blessed are the pure at heart, for they will see the pure God. It should not be so with us. And today, our world is caught up in lustful confusion. You know it. You see it. in immorality. We have the sexual identity crisis. He, she, they, them, transgender, what's being accepted. I don't, it's, it's too much to handle. It's too much to even understand or try to navigate. We need to stick to the word of God. We have, we have pornography and human trafficking available right at our fingertips. Log on our computer, we can get it. We have apps on our phone with access to free, no strings attached sex hookups. It should not be so with, with us. It should not be so for the Christian. Our love for Christ should produce sexual purity. And our homes are the first place we should practice that love of Christ. Our home should be the first place we should practice the purity of Christ. Be careful what you bring into it. Sex outside of marriage destroys and tears down. But sex within marriage glorifies God and promotes healthy relationships with our spouses. We know our partners in ways that no one else does. And ladies, I, I want to be frank with you. If you're struggling with sexual, with sexual sin, you're not alone. We don't talk about it. We don't talk about lust. It's ugly. Everyone struggles. But be restored today. Be restored to purity today. Ask the Lord to cleanse your heart and your mind. King David was restored after he royally messed up with Bathsheba to the point of murder. But he still dealt, after being re restored, he still dealt with the consequences of his sins, the consequences of his actions. So your sin will find you out in one way or another. I, I don't, I'm not saying this to threaten. I'm not saying it to scare you. It's just the truth. As Christians, when we are being sanctified, God brings the ugly stuff out and he deals with it. Be restored today. Amen. First John 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you, God. 
I mess up daily. So now that we, we have all of this information, all of the, you know, the biblical truths in Hebrews 1 through 10, how do we imitate Christ? What do we do with everything? By loving strangers. We love strangers. We love our surrounding community and we love our husbands. And it moves this into more practical reminders in, in uh, verse, 15, verse 5, excuse me, it says, to be content with what we have. Make sure that your character is free from the love of money. Be content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever abandon you. So that we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Be content with what we have. Um, I don't know about you, but contentment can be a huge problem in a beautiful place like Southern California. It's a real thing. I go, to ten I go visit our family in Tennessee, and they don't worry about the stuff that we worry about in California. It seems like, and it feels like, everyone has the best of the best here, right? We drive the nice cars. We have the nice clothes. We go on the nice vacations. Even dogs. Even dogs look better here. I, I'm not lying. They look better. They get groomed better. <clears throat> yeah, it's like our pets are glamorous. I don't know. It's something in the water, probably the beach. But um, yeah, it's an amazing, California's an amazing and incredible place to live. But then the temptation to have more and to accumulate more material things is always there. The temptation to put all of our trust in our finances and our success and find security in making more and more money is always there for us, unfortunately. And if 2020 taught us anything, it's that life can literally change overnight, Right? Money takes wings, it flies away. But God doesn't change. Money can destroy relationships. It can divide families, even godly families. They can fight over money. But I don't want to stray from this. Money is not what's bad. It's the love of money. There's a time and a place and a purpose for money. And if you use it to do the will of God, to, to benefit his church... That's exactly how it should be. Warren Wearsby says, if we love God and others as we should, then we will have a right relationship to material things. Everything has its place, but the love of money will rob you of joy. Why should we, ro why should we be robbed of joy when in his presence is the fullness of joy? Why should we hold on to material things when at his right hand are pleasures and treasures forevermore? I'm preaching this to myself, right? I see a nice thing, I want it. It's a struggle. But he will take care of every need. He's our only sure security. He'll never leave you nor forsake you, as it says, and our hearts will only be satisfied in Jesus. Only be satisfied in Jesus. Another practical reminder we get from the writer we see in verses 7 and verse 17 is to remember the leaders in our faith. Remember the leaders in faith, and for those who rule, those leaders rule with joy. Verse 7 says, Remember your leaders who taught you the word of God. Think of all the good that has come from their lives and follow the example of their faith. Verse 17, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account so that they may do this with joy and not groaning, for this would be unhelpful for you. Take how you treat your leaders seriously. Take how you treat your pastors seriously. Pastors and leaders are here for only one purpose, and they can't save your soul. They can only lead you to the Savior. Pray for them. Support them by praying for them, by serving the body, by working together. This is not a hierarchy where they're better than you, they're, they're more holy than you. God has just ordained them and put them in a role to where they're leading you to Jesus. That's it. We don't put them on a pedestal. We don't make them better. We don't exalt them higher. I don't know why we do that sometimes, our celebrity pastors. But they're just people. Support them by praying for them, please. Serving alongside them. And for those who do rule, to lead seriously. Take what you do seriously. Be care to take... Be, be sure to take care of your flock. Don't mess around with people's souls. It's been really uh, eye-opening 
to see how many pastors have fallen in the past couple years. It should not be so with us. Whether you're leading a, a group here, whether you're raising your kids to know Jesus, whether you're talking to your siblings at home, your parents, take what you're doing seriously. Christ should be evident in the life of every leader, and that's us. You guys, we've studied the, the entire book of Hebrews. You know doctrine. You know truth. Christ should be evident in your lives. And after all these pr practical reminders of how to exemplify Christ in our lives, the writer of Hebrews finally moves into spiritual reminders. <clears throat> right? In verses 8 and 9, it says that we're reminded, we're reminded that we're saved by grace. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. So do not be misled by varied and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods, through which those who were so occupied were not benefited. Because Jesus does not change, doctrine does not change. We're saved by grace. We know that the Hebrews were tempted to turn back to Judaism, right? Turn back to their legalism, but they were also being tempted to follow new and exciting religions new things that, that tickled their ears and made them want to turn. And we have that same temptation here today to find a variation of the gospel that fits our lifestyle. To, it's like build a bear, but build your own Jesus, build your own religion. We have that temptation, but the God of the Bible, ladies, the savior of the world does not change. And we are saved solely because of his grace, because he loves us, nothing else. In verses 10 through 14, we're reminded that we don't belong here. This is not our final place of rest. We, are, we have a place far better than this. We do not belong here. Verse 10 says, we have an altar from which those things who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat for the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy place by the high priest as an offering for sin are burned outside the camp. Verse 12, therefore Jesus also suffered outside the gate that he might sanctify the people through his own blood. So then let us go out to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we do not have a lasting city, but we are seeking the city which is to come. We do not belong here. As the offerings were taken outside the camp to atone for the sins of the people, Christ was, was murdered and crucified on the cross outside the gate so that we would be made holy. In this life, we might join in the reproach and the rejection and the suffering along with Christ, but that suffering is not our end. Amen to that. We have an eternal hope in heaven, and this is the worst. This is the worst right here and on earth. Is, it's the worst we'll ever experience. The best is yet to come for a child of God. What an encouragement that is to someone who's suffering. And since he's the ultimate sacrifice for our redemption, for our salvation, since he's our hope, we offer our sacrifice of praise and worship in return. Verse 15 says, through him then, let's continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips, praising his name. And do not neglect doing good and sharing for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. Complaining is easy. Complaining about suffering, complaining about hardships is easy. But praising God in the good times and in the bad times is acceptable in his sight. Can we talk about how praise is contagious? You notice that? The other day, I should say every day, I'm a mother. But the other day I was having an exceptionally rotten morning. <clears throat> um, completely fleshed out, if I'm being honest, and not in the spirit at all. Frustrated. And I usually listen to podcasts or whatever is on the radio in the car, but I decided to purposefully turn on some worship music because I knew that my soul had to cry out. I needed to worship the Lord. And after I turned on my worship songs and started singing along to the lyrics, my heart softened. And before I knew it, I was grateful that, I was al that I'm alive. I started praying for people that came to remembrance out of nowhere. I was almost crying at the goodness of God where before that I was almost crying because everything was horrible. 
His goodness that he's so patient and kind and tender towards me in spite of my foolishness. And you know, I know the best part is that as I was singing, I could hear my three-year-old in the back seat singing along. Holy, there is no one like you. It's another reminder that he's worthy to be praised. He's worthy to be worshipped. And there's power in praise. This book, this book closes with both the practical behavior reminders, practical behavioral reminders, as well as doctrinal reminders, because we need to grow in both areas. Knowledge and character. One without the other is a sign of spiritual immaturity. Understanding the word should lead, it, lead to applying it to our lives. So there's a balance. Now, I know this was a lot of instruction, and it seems like a, a long list of to-dos or not to-dos, right? Don't do this, do this. Um, but please don't be overwhelmed. I was a little bit overwhelmed when I was getting into this. I'm not going to lie. It seemed like just a long list of structure. But the exhortation to grow in spiritual maturity, it's not being said in a condemning way. I'm not trying to add bricks to your backpack. You're not being placed under a microscope and overly examined and ripped apart to perfection. That's not what this is. This is an exhortation to live freely in the freedom that you have in Christ because he is good, because he's greater than and he's superior to and he's better and it's a privilege to serve him. And as we grow in him, as we grow in the knowledge of him naturally, We start to look like him and act like him. God is able to finish the work that he started in you. I love that promise. Not because of anything we give to him, but because he loves us so much and he's willing to fight for us. Because of his mercy toward us, we can come boldly to his throne in honesty and without shame. Thank you, Lord. Let's close with verses 20 and 21. It says, Now may the God of peace, who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the eternal covenant that is Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I love that title of Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep. There's a rabbinic teaching of Moses after he fled Egypt and he was watching watching his father-in-law's flock in the wilderness. And it's said that a kid, a young goat, wandered away from the flock. And Moses saw it, patiently followed the goat until it reached a shady place. And there he found it drinking from a stream. But when Moses approached it, he said gently, So it was because you were thirsty that you wandered away. You must be so weary. And without anger at the trouble the goat had caused, without anger at the time it had wasted, making him leave the the, the rest of the flock, he picked up the goat, placed it on his shoulder, and carried him home. If the thought of continuing in your race sounds difficult, or draining, too much to bear, our shepherd is able to pick you up and carry you home. John chapter 10 says, Jesus says that he is the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep, and we have the promise that no one is able to snatch us from his hand. No one. In his grace, he will not let you go. Someone needs to hear that today. It's me. I need to hear it. You are in the hands of God. We are in the hands of God. You're sealed by the promise of his covenant. He knows you need him, and he will not let you go. He will equip you.